Hi everyone, and welcome to the learning series on quantum computing. So the way this video is going to be structured is that we're going to have review slides every about seven slides, and those are going to be intended so that you can pause the video and just make sure uh, you understand what's going on. If not, you can leave a comment and I will respond to them. Uh, so with that, let's begin the learning series on Shor's algorithm, which is an application of quantum computers to break one of the most common modern crypto systems. So information in a quantum computer is represented in qubits as opposed to a classical computer which uses bits, that is, ones and zeros. Uh, a qubit is represented in the form of a superposition, which is a combination of multiple states. So instead of just being one or zero, it's one and zero in a specific combination. And because they represent wave functions, they have a complex phase in addition to amplitude. And we'll go more into detail on that later. Uh, the picture on the right of that slide is the quantum computer that IBM built. So why do we want to use quantum computers? And the fact that they represent information as wave functions uh, means that the wave functions can interfere with each other. Uh, and in particular, because of the quantum property of them, they can go into a state called entanglement, where multiple qubits are basically all connected with each other, and you can't affect one without affecting all of them at the same time. And so the idea that we're going to try to manipulate here is take advantage of the fact that these are wave functions because, as we know, waves can interfere constructively and destructively. What we want to do is make it so that we have destructive interference so that a lot of the possible outcomes uh, go to zero, meaning that we don't get the undesirable outcomes and we're only going to get the one that we want. Uh, another way to see the possible information we can exploit is that we have, let's say we have a system of n qubits that are entangled with each other. Then because each qubit can either be 0 or 1, uh, and they're all independent of each other, then each qubit uh, is going to double the amount of states that you have. So if you have n qubits, you're going to have 2 to the n possible states. And remember that because of entanglement, we're actually computing on all of those at the same time. So the motivation for this, which is the specific quantum algorithm we're going to go into detail on, is Shor's algorithm. So one of the most common crypto systems is RSA. And RSA is based on the idea that factoring a large semi-prime integer, uh, where that's a number that's the product of two prime factors and nothing else, that's considered computationally hard. What computationally hard means is that it takes so long to solve it, even a supercomputer can't crack it. So the useful kinds of computational hard problems are the ones where it's hard to solve them, but if you know the solution, it's easy to verify it. And you can see that factoring falls into this, because in order to factor something, we're going to have to effectively try a lot of possible factors, and we don't really know where to start with that. But if you want to check if your factorization is correct, all you need to do is just multiply two numbers together. And of course, that's pretty easy to do. So. If we're using a classical computer, then the best we can get in terms of uh, algorithmic complexity is the general number field sieve. And that can factor an n bit number in that formula, which is considered sub exponential time number of, exp ex number of operations. And so uh, we'll expand on what exactly that sub exponential time complexity means uh, in a bit. And in comparison, though, a quantum computer can solve it on the order of n cubed operations. And actually, n cubed means that it's fast enough that we can actually realistically solve this. So if we had a functioning quantum computer that was able to handle large enough numbers, then we would be able to break cryptography, because we would be able to factor that number fast enough. And so this is known as Shor's algorithm, because it was discovered by Peter Shor in 1994. So we're going to go into some visualizations of what does the sub-exponential time complexity mean. The red uh, graph there is actually the sub-exponential time complexity that I showed in the previous slide. And so you can see kind of in this picture that it starts growing really fast compared to the blue one, which is a uh, cubic graph. And if I zoom out even more, you can see that it grows really, really fast in comparison. And so the reason this is important is if you look on the x-axis of the graph there, where it really starts to explode is at 20, 20 bits, right? But when we think about 
RSA, most RSA keys people use is 2048 bits. So when you compare them at that scale, the red sub exponential graph is just going to be so enormously big compared to the cubic one. And it's completely impossible to factor an RSA key by brute force, uh, even if you had a supercomputer and a billion years to spare. In comparison, if you had a quantum computer that was able to do this, then you would be able to do it in a pretty reasonable amount of time uh, with a reasonable amount of resources. And so that's why this matters. So let's review what we talked about so far. A quantum computer is different from a classical computer because it represents information in qubits, which is a quantum analog to a bit that is a combination of 0 and 1 rather than just being 0 or 1. And qubits hold a lot more information than classical bits do, uh, as we'll expand on in a bit as well. And each qubit state is represented by a complex number. And it also, because it, if you think about it as being a wave function, then it also has a phase, meaning it's some offset from being like a perfect wave that matches the equation. And so what we're going to do with the quantum computer is use it to factor integers in polynomial time. And so for large enough numbers, uh, as are the ones that we use in cryptography, it's impossible to factor them with a classical computer, which is kind of the point. But a quantum computer can do this. So pause the video, make sure you've got what's going on. If not, leave a comment. So how does a qubit work? Let's find out. A single qubit represents a specific combination of the states 0 and 1. Uh, however, the magnitude of the combination is always going to be exactly equal to 1. That being said, the coefficients of them are not just real numbers, but in general they're complex numbers. So we're going to use an example, which is 1 half times e to the 2 pi i over 5 times the 0 state, plus square root 3 over 2 times e to the 4 pi i over 5 times the 1 state. And the magnitude here is going to be 1, because we take 1 half, we square it, we get 1 fourths. And we take square root 3 over 2, we square it, we get 3 fourths. And add them up, you get 1. Uh, so the reason we can ignore when computing the magnitude, the e to the i theta term, is because e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta, if you remember from trig. And so that is a complex number with a magnitude exactly equal to 1. So when we're trying to compute the magnitude, we can just ignore it. So because the magnitude is always 1, and we're going to remember that cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, again, from trig. And so that allows us to write it in terms of an angle, theta over 2. The reason it's theta over 2 is because uh, it simplifies a mathematical expression that we're going to use later. So uh, if you notice here, we have assigned some portion of the magnitude to the 0 state, which is cosine of theta over 2, and the other portion is going to the 1 state in sine theta over 2. And so that angle determines the relative magnitude between 0 and 1. Uh, however, we also know that these numbers have a complex phase, and we're going to represent that by phi. Uh, something important is that phi represents the relative phase. The reason for that is because the global phase, meaning uh, a phase that's common to both the 0 and 1 states, there's no way physically to measure that. It's completely indistinguishable uh, between if you had a global phase of, say, pi over 2 versus a global phase of 0. However, what we're going to uh, denote is the relative phase. That's the difference in angle between the 1 and the 0 states. So let's go back to our example before. We had 1 half times e to the 2 pi i over 5 plus square root 3 over 2 times e to the 4 pi i over 5 on the 1 state. So notice that both the 0 and the 1 states have this common factor of e to the 2 pi i over 5. That's what the global phase is. And because it can't be measured, uh, we can't use it for anything, so we can get rid of it and get this completely equivalent expression that's simpler to work with. What we get is 1 half times the 0 state plus square root 3 over 2 times e to the 2 pi i over 5 times the 1 state. And we got e to the 2 pi i over 5 because we subtracted 2 pi i over 5 from the original, which was 4 pi i over 5, when we removed the global phase. So now let's go through an example of how you would convert something from the state vector representation, which is just the 
coefficients of 0 and 1, as you see here, to the theta and phi representation, which is going to be referred to as spherical coordinates or the polar representation. Uh, so first we're going to go through what are the advantages of each of them. The advantages of the spherical coordinate representation is if you think about something as being an angle, uh, some operations are easier to conceptualize. However, when you're talking about actually doing an operator on the quantum qubit state, then you're going to want to use the state vector representation. The reason is because our operators are going to be matrices, and so multiplying a matrix by a vector is easy. It's not so easy if you have it in the form of angles. So now let's just work through this. So theta over 2 is going to be the inverse cosine of 1 half, uh, because we know cosine theta over 2 has to be 1 half. And so we're going to get pi over 3 for that. Uh, whereas phi is going to be the difference in phase, which is the relative phase of 2 pi over 5, as we talked about in the last slide. Therefore, we can represent the state uh, like this. So we said theta over 2 was 60, so multiply that by 2 to get 120 degrees. So the state is going to be 120 de cosine of 120 degrees over 2 times 0 plus sine of 120 degrees over 2 times e to the 2 pi i over 5 times the 1 state. And again, we remove the global phase of 2 pi i over 5 as I showed you in the last slide. So what What's important is that we reduce the qubit state down to just two angles, which are represented by real numbers. So now what we can do is take advantage of the fact that the magnitude, in other words, the radius, is 1. So we can interpret the qubit state as spherical coordinates. Uh, this visualization, which you see here, is called the block sphere. So uh, the theta and phi that we're talking about are the same theta and phi as before, but as compared with uh, the usual spherical coordinates, which you might have learned about before, uh, in this case, phi represents the angle in the plane. Uh, that is, if you think about uh, what theta normally is in spherical coordinates, it's what is the angle of rotation if you think about like the flat plane. Uh, however, in this case, theta represents the angle of the vertical which, if you look at the representation, it does sort of make sense, because uh, theta represents how much magnitude is at 0 versus how much magnitude is at 1, right? So you know that theta has to modify where its position is vertically. So this is why we had the angle expressed as theta over 2, because a theta of 0 corresponds to everything being in the 0 state, and a theta of 180 degrees corresponds to everything being in the 1 state. And so that allows us to give this uh, nice angular representation. As you can see, the, the arc between 0 and 1 is a 180 degree arc, as you would expect. And this sphere representation demonstrates how qubits have so much more information in them compared to a classical bit. Because in a classical bit, you would just have 0 or 1. So it's like saying, uh, if we're comparing this to the Earth, for instance, if with a cl classical computer, I can say, I'm in the Northern Hemisphere. With a quantum computer, I can tell you, I'm in Providence, Rhode Island. That tells you a specific point on the sphere where I am, instead of just, you know, top or bottom. And so that's a lot of information that you can get, and that's exactly what we're trying to take advantage of when we use quantum computers. So... When we measure a qubit, uh, this is one of the key quantum things we can do, is that it forces the qubit or multi-qubit combination, if they're entangled, it forces all of that to take on a definite state. So the way that that works is it samples from a probability distribution, which is based on the relative magnitude of each of the states. And remember that because the magnitude is always 1, that makes this an easy probability distribution because the magnitudes themselves are the probabilities and they add up to one like any probability distribution has to. So we'll use our example again. One half e to the two pi i over five times zero plus square root three over two e to the four pi i over five times one. And that's going to have a one fourth probability of zero and a three fourths probability of one. We got that by squaring the magnitudes as we have done before. 
Now, one of the key things to note here is that qubits can become entangled with each other, leading to multi-qubit states. Uh, so for instance, if we had two qubits, then there's going to be coefficients of each of the four possible states, which are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And this is going to lead to having 2 to the n states, where you have n qubits. And the reason for this is, uh, as you can see here, uh, for one qubit, we have two possible states. For two qubits, we had four. For three, we can have all of those possible states, and the third qubit can be one or it can be zero. So it's going to double it again. And that's how we have an exponentially no growing number of qubits. Now we have to think about how do we exploit this exponentially growing number of qubits on top of the fact that qubits themselves carry so much more information than normal. So what we do is use quantum circuits in order to manipulate all of these states at the same time, uh, all of the multi-qubit states. And then we're going to use destructive interference uh, because, again, they're wave functions. They're waves. They can be represented as something that is uh, a periodic function. And so that's going to be important. And so wave waves, uh, even water waves and other classical things, can interfere. And when they interfere destructively, it means that two waves add to each other and it becomes a total of zero. And when it's zero, it means we're not going to measure it. So the idea is, after doing destructive interference, we're going to measure the system, and then only the correct answer will be what we measure. So now let's review what we just talked about. We took the qubit state, which was originally two complex numbers, and we represented the state in terms of two angles, theta and phi. And theta and phi are spherical coordinates, and the representation on the sphere is called the block sphere. And by looking at the block sphere, we can just see how much more information qubits carry compared to classical bits. Each point on the block sphere represents a unique combination of 0 and 1, as well as a unique relative phase, which is a rotation in that plane. When we measure a qubit, uh, as we just saw, that collapses the wave function, so it takes on a single state by measuring from a probability distribution. And finally, we have the concept of entanglement, which we've mentioned uh, a few times before, which is that uh, qubits are multiple qubits are forced to take on a state where they are uh, all forced to act all at the same time, so that if you measure that system, then it's going to collapse the wave function of that's all of those qubit states combined, and that's how we can exploit the uh, quantum computation, really. So that's a key thing to think about, is that we're computing on everything at once, and then when we measure, we are making it so that everything except a few of the qubit states is set to zero. And again, pause the video, make sure you know what's going on before you go to the next part. So now that we know what a qubit is and what it does, let's talk about how do we use them. So quantum circuits are the things that we're going to use to manipulate qubits and sets of qubits. So quantum circuits use logic gates, which are very similar to logic gates that you see in classical circuits. Uh, you know, you might have heard like a AND gate, NOT gate, etc. However, Quantum operators must be unitary operators. Uh, if you care about linear algebra, that means, first of all, they don't change the magnitude of the input, which is important because our magnitude has to always be 1. And the property of being unitary is defined by its inverse is equal to its transposed complex conjugate. Again, that isn't super important to know, but that is one way to define it. And it's an easy way to compute the inverse as well, which is nice. So a quantum gate that takes in n operators is going to be represented by a 2n by 2n matrix. The reason for this is because each qubit has the 0 state and the 1 state. Important thing, all quantum circuits are invertible because all quantum gates are invertible, and all combinations of quantum gates could technically be expressed as a much larger quantum gate, but it's totally inconvenient and hard to understand that way, so we write it as if it's a circuit. Uh, but again, you can invert this uh, no matter what it is.
So the first gate we're going to talk about is the Hadamard gate. And the Hadamard gate is a fundamental quantum operator. What it does is it takes the vector that is on the poles, you know, the top is zero, the bottom is one. It takes those and it, it rotates them away from the poles and into the plane. Uh, so what you're doing, if you think about the spherical coordinates, is importantly, you are changing theta. So the zero state becomes zero plus one and we divide by square root of 2 because the magnitude has to stay as equal to 1. And the same thing for the 1 state, except it becomes 0 minus 1. And so these states are now referred to as the plus state and the minus states. Uh, the Hadamard gate, uh, as all quantum gates are, is going to be a reversible invertible operator. So this is a diagram of where exactly all of these states are on the, on the block sphere and what the Hadamard gate does to them. Uh, don't worry about the arrows, uh, because they seem to be a little bit misleading. But anyway, first thing to note is on the left, the Hadamard gate is its own inverse, because h of plus takes you back to zero, and h of minus takes you back to one. Next, we notice where these things are situated on the plane. So the zero goes to the plus state, and we're going to consider that as having a relative phase of zero. However, the one goes to the minus state, and compared to the plus state, that has a phase of 180 degrees or half a full rotation. But the point is, now that they're both on the plane, you can actually rotate them uh, using a rotation operator, which is going to be the next thing that we're going to do. So again, the, the use of the Hadamard gate, as we're going to see, is when we're thinking about a qubit or set of qubits in terms of being zeros and ones, then it allows us to take the zero and one components and rotate them. Then we can manipulate those using rotations. So uh, we can go into detail here about what a Hadamard gate will do to something that's not just all zero or all one, because remember, a qubit state is a superposition of zero and one. So let's take the Hadamard gate, uh, and we're going to apply it to a more complex state. What we're doing here is we are going to treat the uh, zero and one components independently and add them together when we apply this operator. Uh, because of how matrix multiplication works, we are allowed to do that, and that's the way we should do it. So let's let x be our qubit state, which is the same example we've been using thus far, which is 1 half times 0 plus square root 3 over 2 times e to the 2 pi i over 5 times 1. Now, all we have to do is apply the Hadamard gate, which turns the 0 into plus, and it turns the 1 into minus. So we have 1 half times plus, plus square root 3 over 2 times e to the 2 pi i over 5 times minus. And now here is where the expression gets a little bit more complicated, is when we expand out the plus state. And that's because we know plus is equal to uh, 0 plus 1 all over square root 2. We know minus is 0 minus 1 all over square root 2. So now if we expand it, we get this long expression. And believe it or not, this can also be represented in spherical coordinates, but the number we get in the end is extremely not nice, so I have neglected to show it here. And the important thing to note here is that the output of quantum gates, much like the qubits itself, contains a lot of information when you apply it to complex qubit states. So we we went from this state, which may have uh, seemed simple before, and that's what we get as the output. And it just goes to show you how much information is contained in the qubits, and when we manipulate them, they retain this information. Uh, and so as far as what that computation actually resolves to, that's what it is. Uh, so that's why I did not share it, because you won't get anything out of trying to understand this computation. It's just a lot of uh, arctangent stuff, basically. So the next gate, uh, this one is actually more simple than the Hadamard gate. All this does is it applies a relative phase to the one part of the qubit. And that relative phase we're going to use is just 1 over 2 to the k of a full rotation. Uh, this notation is just convenient uh, for the quantum circuits we're going to use in a little bit. Uh, but, you know, what we're doing is just rotating the one part of it by a certain angle. Uh, that is relatively easy to do. Uh, so in other words, we're adding 2 pi over 2 to the k to the angle phi. 
So these this kind of works in conjunction with the Hadamard when you think about it. The Hadamard is the thing that allows a qubit state to be rotated, and then we use this U-rod gate unitary rotation to actually do the rotation. So here is a diagram of what the U-rod gate does. So let's say we're starting with the plus state. We're going to consider that zero degrees, right? Now we used u rot 1 on the plus state, and as we expect, 180 degrees is half of a full rotation, so that takes us all the way to the minus state. Uh, if we apply u rot 2 on the plus state, we get a state of 90 degrees, and that's because that's one-fourth of a full rotation, uh, and 2 squared, of course, is 4. Finally, if we apply the u rot 3 gate, we get a 45-degree rotation because that's one-eighth of a full rotation. And this continues on, this pattern of uh, half having the angle every time uh, works indefinitely. So that's what the U-rod gate actually does. And so if you had something that wasn't exactly on the plane, it would do the same thing, just at a different height. Uh, so here we have a height of zero, but if you think about uh, spherical coordinates, uh, you can apply a plane rotation uh, at any point on the sphere. The only thing is... If you're at the poles, then that plane rotation does nothing. Anywhere else, it does do something. So let's review what we talked about in this section. Quantum gates are the fundamental component of a quantum circuit, and each quantum gate is a unitary, invertible matrix that applies a transformation to a qubit, or uh, in some cases, a combination of multiple qubits. You can have multi-qubit gates, as we're going to get into in a little bit. The Hadamard gate is uh, the first qubit gate that we talked about, and what that does is it takes the states from being at the poles, the 0 and 1, to being on the plane, which is a combination of 0 and 1. And the unitary rotation gate is the sort of complement to the Hadamard gate, meaning that the Hadamard gate allows the rotation to happen, and then the unitary rotation gate actually does the rotation. All that does is add a number to the relative phase. And so that one is pretty simple to understand. Pause the video, make sure you got what I've said on this slide, and then we can continue. In this section, we're going to cover the quantum Fourier transform, so buckle up. Uh, we need to introduce one last quantum gate, which is the controlled unitary rotation. This is uh, very similar to the U-rot gate, except this is a two-qubit gate. So what the controlled U-rot gate does is it applies the U-rot function to Y only if X is 1, given a qubit state XY. So in effect, what this is doing is it applies this rotation to the 1, 0, and 1, 1 states, and it leaves the 0, 0, and 0, 1 states uh, alone. So this allows us to make two qubits interact with each other. And uh, for an example of what this does, U-rot applied to 0, 1 is just going to be 0, 1. But U-rot applied to 1, 0 is going to be the 1 state, same as before, but the 0 state, the second qubit, now has that U-rot applied to it. So, now we're going to talk about the quantum Fourier transform now that we have all of the gates that we needed to introduce. So, what is the quantum Fourier transform? It's this thing that you see in the animation. What this is, is a change of basis. The thing you see at the top is like a number represented in binary, so that's what we call the computational basis. As you can see in the top animation, those bits are turning off and on, and it's the same as the representation of a number in binary. Uh, and that one is pretty straightforward as long as you understand binary. The thing at the bottom is the Fourier basis, and that represents the numbers instead as angles. So if you're looking at what's going on, you see the first qubit is going in really small uh, segments of rotation. Those are 1 16th of a full rotation, 22.5 degrees. The next one is going around in increments of 45 degrees. The next one is going around in increments of 90 degrees. And finally, the last one is going around in increments of 180 degrees. So you can see that the first qubit has the most precision uh, out of all of them. So. Uh, before we get into what this quantum Fourier transform is useful for, just a reminder that this is something that's invertible. And that's important because actually the next thing we're going to do with it uses the inverse QFT. And we don't actually use the quantum Fourier transform directly to do anything, only its inverse. But it's important to understand what it does here. 
So uh, what we're doing here is changing this qubit state from a number representation to an angle representation. Now let's think about uh, how we're going to do that. So let's take our number, say, 13 in the computational basis. That's 1101, one, one, and we want to make that into an angle. So what we're going to do is, because computation is reversible, uh, we have to make each of these states uh, take on varying precisions, basically. So that's what we saw in the last slide, where the first one was going around in small increments of angle, and the next one is going around in a bigger increment, and so on. And although this may seem a little bit odd, because we talked about a single qubit state there, remember that this is going to be happening to all of the qubit states at once, and that's why we need all this information. And again, the QFT is, or not again, but the QFT is going to reverse the order of the qubits. Uh, this isn't really important other than just something to notice. So now let's get into the quantum circuit for the QFT. Uh, given that what we're trying to do is take this number in binary and encode that information in terms of the angles. So uh, this circuit looks scary. I won't deny that. Uh, it's exactly what I just described as how we're going to implement it. So uh, even if you don't fully understand what is going to happen in the next five minutes, just make sure you understand that this is going from numbers in binary to angles. And it's a change of basis matrix, or a change of basis transformation, which incidentally can be represented by a matrix. And so that's important to remember, and especially important to remember that we can take QFT inverse, because that's what we're actually going to do. So each successive qubit that we're taking gets one less uh, precision bit, you could call it, applied to it. So if you look at uh, up to step three on that diagram, we went from u rot 2 all the way to u rot n, right? And so in total, we're having n operators applied to the first qubit. Second qubit, we have, we go only to u rot n minus 1, so we have n minus 1 total operators. Finally, the last qubit only gets the single u rot 2 operator as well as the Hadamard gate applied to it. And so as you can see, uh, we're decreasing the amount of precision that we put in each qubit by giving it less information as we go on successively. Uh, the reason that there are Hadamard gates at the start is because they put qubits onto the plane of rotation. Also, something to note is that the UROT effectively acts as a rotation itself because you remember the plus state, we consider that to be 0 degrees, and the minus state, we consider that to be 180 degrees. And the minus state is the function of the 1 state. So essentially what we did is, by applying the Hadamard gate, we did rotate the 1 state 180 degrees. So now we're going to go step by step through this uh, so we can explain in more detail how this works and why this works. Uh, important thing to notice is you see those lines drawn to black dots on the diagram that represents a controlled unitary rotation. So the black dot is the gate that it's controlled by, and the u rot, of course, is the it represents the qubit that is getting rotated. So what we did at step one, denoted by that red dashed line, is we just took the Hadamard gate. We applied that to qubit x1. We put it on the plane. We didn't do anything else yet. In state 2, we applied the u rot 2, which is one fourth of a full rotation, onto x1, controlled by x2. Uh, and we essentially have added information from x2 onto x1. And remember that this only happens for the component of x2 where the state is 1 and not the component where the state is 0. That's an important thing to note. Now, if our number x was 13, which is the example we're going to be using, then after state 2, we have an angle of 180 degrees from the first Hadamard gate plus 90 degrees from the u rot 2 gate. Uh, that's because uh, we're looking at x2 is going to be 1 here. So we do apply the unitary rotation. So now let's take a look at state 3. What we've done here is repeated step 2, but they're going to be controlled by every other qubit this time. So we're going to, if our number is 13, then x1 is going to get 
uh, the 180 degrees and 90 degrees that I talked about in the last slide, plus zero degrees from the x3 qubit, and that's because x3 is set to zero, plus 22.5 degrees from x4, and that's because x4 is set to one. When you add them up together, you get 13 sixteenths of a full rotation, which is what we should get because we, are, we started with 13 in binary. So in state four, what we're gonna do is repeat the exact same process we just did, but do it with x2. And one thing to note here, as you can see on the diagram, we're not getting any information from x1 this time. No gates are controlled by x1. And that's the decreasingly high precision that we're going to uh, use for the QFT. So let's examine what specifically happens to x2 here. x2 is left with a state of 180 degrees from its own Hadamard gate plus zero degrees from the UROT gate controlled by x3, uh, same as before, plus 45 degrees from the UROT gate controlled by x4. The reason that it's 45 degrees here and not 22.5 degrees is because we started on x2, so all of those angles are going to be multiplied by 2 compared to what they were previously. Now, what we get is 225 degrees, which is 5 eighths of a full rotation. The reason that it's 5 eighths is because we look at the last three bits, that's 1, 0, 1 in binary. In other words, that's 5. And so that's why it's 5 out of a total possible 8, uh, 8 eighths of a full rotation. And so this is the pattern that we're looking for when we do the quantum Fourier transform, is truncating each bit off one at a time, starting from the leftmost bit, and those get turned into angles of rotation. And to be clear, those angles are the relative phase phi that we talked about before. So now state four is uh, an extension of, again, what we just did to x2, we're going to do it to x3, and then x4. And this uh, generalizes to if you had more than four qubits in the qubit state, but I think four is a good number for explaining this. So what happens to x3? The Hadamard gate puts it into the plus state instead of the minus state this time, so it gets a rotation of zero from itself, and then from x4, it gets a rotation of 90 degrees from the UROT2 gate. And so we get a one-fourth of a full rotation, and that's because our number is 0, 1 in binary. Finally, uh, x4 gets the Hadamard gate applied to itself, and so it goes into the minus state, and it gets one-half of a full rotation. That's because our number in binary is just 1. So... Now let's review what we did. So the quantum Fourier transform is an invertible quantum circuit, and it is a change of basis. It changes uh, from the poles of the sphere to angles in the plane, which is kind of an analogy of uh, what we talked about with the Hadamard gate, except in this case uh, it's more complicated because it's a multiple qubit system that we're operating on. Uh, in fact, if you were operating the QFT on just one thing, it would be only the Hadamard gate. So uh, you could think of it maybe as an extension of the Hadamard gate to a multiple qubit system. So what we're doing here is we take the number that was in the computational basis and we put it into the Fourier basis. Remember that the computational basis is like standard binary numbers and the Fourier basis is the angles that we're used to. The way we did this is by using the Hadamard gate at first and then doing controlled unitary rotations where we're sort of manually adding this rotation uh, which is controlled by the qubits that are in some sense below it or after it. So for instance, x1 gets rotated by x2, x3, and x4 x2 gets rotated by x3 and x4, and x3 gets rotated by x4. Uh, x4 gets rotated by nothing other than itself, of course. Uh, and the rotation applied to itself is what the Hadamard gate does. And the end result is this series of angles in decreasingly high precision. So we saw that the first qubit is down to 1 16th of a rotation, the next one is only down to 1 8th of a rotation, the next one is down to only 1 4th of a rotation, and the last qubit is down to only one half of a rotation. And so, uh, again, this may seem like it's weird to want to do this, but you have to remember that we're operating on a superposition, and it's going to be in all of those quantum states at once. So we're actually operating on a combination of not just 13, but all of the numbers from 0 through 15. 
So, and the QFT applies this transformation to all of them all at once. So again, pause this video for a bit if you have to, and we're going to move on now. Quantum phase estimation. This is the thing we really are trying to do. This is something that uses the inverse QFT, and that's why we learned about the QFT in the first place. So quantum phase estimation is the idea that, let's say we have a mystery quantum operator U, uh, and we also have an eigenvector of that operator U. Uh, we're going to call that eigenvalue lambda. So refresher for anyone who doesn't remember, uh, an eigenvector is a it's a quantum state in this case where if you apply that operator to the quantum state it's going to rotate that whole quantum state by a specific phase but it's not going to change the relative magnitude at all it's only going to apply a, a relative phase to it that's what the eigenvalue means in this context and that's because uh, any eigenvalue which is in general just a number that the output gets multiplied by, it has to have magnitude 1. And so what that means is it's going to be e to the 2 pi i times some number, because it has to be magnitude 1, or else the operator would not be unitary. So what we're doing with quantum phase estimation is we're kind of doing the QFT, except instead of the u rot gate, we're using this operator u, uh, and the way that we're doing that is by using this eigenvector because we're getting essentially a unitary rotation in a special case. So we're doing the QFT in a certain sense, and then we're using the inverse QFT at the end to get back the angle. Uh, and the angle is going to be multiplied by 2 to the n for uh, reasons that I'll explain in a bit. Uh, so Although you may get lost in the following slides, uh, I would say it's probably likely because this is much harder to understand than the QFT. Uh, it's important to remember that this is what we're doing. We're doing something like the QFT, except we replace the unitary rotations with this new operator, and then we use inverse QFT. What we're trying to do is get an estimation of this eigenvalue, which is the amount that this function rotates its specific eigenvector by. Uh, that's the key point. Now we're going to go through this uh, and so see what you can get out of this. This is the quantum circuit for quantum phase estimation, and uh, it's admittedly much more complicated than the QFT circuit. In fact, it contains QFT inverse inside it. So. First, we start with this system of t qubits, which are th which is the thing on the top at that circuit, and that uh, circle with the x in it just represents t of them all in superposition with each other, and they're entangled. So, what we're doing is we're applying this unitary rotation u. Uh, it's not actually a unitary rotation, but it is when you consider it applied only to that eigenvector psi. So what we're doing is kind of like the QFT, uh, where we're manually doing rotations in a specific order, except this time we have used this new operator, which we're trying to measure the property of. So uh, those things at the bottom where you see u to the power of 2 to the t minus 1, that denotes the operator u applied that many times. So it it gets applied, let's say t was 5, then t minus 1 is 4, u to the 2 to the 4 means applying u 16 times. And so after we do the QFT inverse, this arrow with the arc, that represents the measurement operator. We're actually only measuring those qubits that we have at the top and not the ones at the bottom. Uh, and the output that we get here is going to be 2 to the t times theta, where theta is the same thing as lambda, that is our eigenvalue, or in other words, the phase in quantum phase estimation. That's the thing we're trying to estimate. So, as we said, we took a set of t qubits, which are in the zero state, then we applied Hadamard gate to all of them, now we have t qubits that are all in the plus state. Again, t is going to be the number of qubits that are in psi, the eigenvector. So now we are 
going to apply the unitary rotation, the controlled unitary rotation gate again, except it's not exactly that because again, we're using this mystery operator u instead. Uh, however, what you'll notice here is that this time they're controlled by the qubits that are on top. They're controlled by those uh, qubits that are just in the plus state. Uh, and the reason for this is due to a mathematical equivalence that I'm going to show on the board and you won't understand. Uh, so let's just skip to this. This is the equivalence where what it's saying is that even though we are controlling it by the top qubits, uh, effectively it's the same as if we were rotating the top qubits. That is the t qubits that were in the plus state. It's as if we rotated those uh, by this angle, which is the eigenvalue or the phase of u. Uh, and so this is the reason why, but I don't expect you to understand what's going on here. Now, let's go back to this circuit. So at step two, uh, what we did is we took our u to the 2 to the n operators, as I mentioned. We did the controlled rotations. And we're treating them as if they're u rot vectors because since we're only applying them to psi, they effectively are. Uh, what this leads to is the, let's say theta is the, the phase, the eigenvalue, then the first qubit is going to have a relative phase of 2 to the t minus 1 times 2 pi i theta. Second one has a relative phase of 2 to the t minus 2 times 2 pi i theta, and so on. Now, if we divide all of those numbers by 2 to the t, we notice that what we got was the output of the q of t. So if we don't divide them by 2 to the t, then when we take q of t inverse and measure, what we get is 2 to the t times theta. And that is our estimation of the phase. That is the quantum phase estimation. So I know that was a lot to take in. Uh, so I'm going to review the key points here. Uh, which are just what it does more so than how it works. Quantum phase estimation is something that allows us to estimate the eigenvalue or the phase of a function, a unitary operator because it's a quantum gate like anything else. And we're having t bits of precision where t is the size of the eigenvector or the number of qubits that it operates on. The way that we did this is by using controlled unitary rotations and then taking the QFT inverse. And what we get is, after we measure it, we get this t bit state in the computational basis. And what that is, is it's 2 to the t times the angle, the phase, which is lambda, the eigenvalue, or theta. They're all the same thing here. Uh, so basically, we did QFT, and then we did QFT inverse immediately after, except Instead of using the u rot operators, which we did in QFT when we were describing the circuit, now we're using this operator u. And that has this rotational phase we don't know. So we take QFT inverse. That tells us what the eigenvalue of the matrix is. That eigenvalue is the phase that's talked about in quantum phase estimation. So make sure you understand the bullet points that are on this side. Uh, don't necessarily worry too much if you don't understand what happened in the last three, four slides about how it works, but what it does is important. And then we can carry on to the easier part. All right, so you may recognize this slide. This is the slide about Shor's algorithm. So what does Shor's algorithm do? It's used to break a crypto system called RSA. And RSA is based on the assumption that if you're trying to factor this large semi-prime integer, then that's going to be really hard to do, and even a supercomputer can't do it. Again, semi-prime means it's the product of two primes, p and q. Uh, and so it has exactly two prime factors, no more, no less. And remember that our quantum computer, as we saw on those graphs before, it can solve it in polynomial time, specifically n cubed, and that's really fast compared to what a classical computer can do, or rather can't do. Shor's algorithm uses quantum phase estimation, which is the thing we just did to factor an integer. Now we're going to go into depth on how exactly this works. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have sort of checked out of the video by now, but probably you might want to start paying attention again because it gets easier from here. 
Okay, so now we're going to introduce some basic number theory. For a lot of you, this will just be a review, and maybe you can skip it if you want, but uh, otherwise I'm going to introduce some basic concepts that we're going to need. So we're going to denote the remainder of x when we divide it by y as x mod y. So let's say 15. 15 mod 3 is 0. That's because 3 goes into 15, so it has a remainder of 0. Uh, but for example, 15 mod 4 is 3. That's because 4 times 3 is 12. We've still got a remainder of 3. So 15 mod 4 is equal to 3 because that's the remainder. Now, an important property of modular arithmetic, as it's called, is that addition, multiplication, and exponentiation are unaffected mod q. So 2 to the 4 mod 5 is 16 mod 5, and 16 mod 5 is, of course, 1, because 5 times 3 is 15, plus 1 is 16. Now 7 to the 4 mod 5, 7 to the 4 is 2401, and of course we can see 2401 is 1 more than a multiple of 5, so that's also 1 mod 5. The reason for this is because 7 mod 5 is congruent to 2 mod 5. They both have the same remainder, which is 2 mod 5. Now, when I say exponentiation is unaffected mod q, I'm talking about the base of the exponents. The uh, exponents themselves actually live mod another number, uh, which is sort of the basis for the RSA algorithm, but is irrelevant to what we're trying to do today. If you're interested, uh, look up phi of n, or it's called Euler's totient function. And that is the number that the exponents live mod that number. Anyway, so let's take an integer a, which is relatively prime to n. What relatively prime to n means is the GCD of a and n is 1. In other words, a has no factors in common with n. And so we're going to define this term, which is really important. The order of a mod n is the smallest exponent k such that a to the k is congruent to 1. So what's the order of 2 mod 15? That's going to be 4 because 2 to the 4 is 16, and 16 mod 15 is 1, of course. So next, a function is periodic if it repeats itself after a certain time. That time is called the period. So if you think about sine x, that's a obviously periodic function, and the period of that is 2 pi. Next, the other function that's periodic that actually is important is this function a to the x mod n, which is uh, what we just talked about. That period is equal to, by definition, the order of a mod n, because once it becomes uh, 1 mod n, that exponent value, then of course it's going to repeat itself, because 1 times a is a, and it's going to start over from there. Now, what we need this for is that quantum period finding is a procedure that can be used to determine the period of any arbitrary function efficiently. Now, quantum period finding, it turns out, is the same exact problem as quantum phase estimation. It uses the same circuit, and so we don't need to learn anything new to do quantum period finding. Now we're going to get into how Shor's algorithm is actually implemented, and again, everything that we're talking about here is going to happen on a classical computer. This is uh, pre- and post-processing. Only the quantum period finding happens on the quantum computer. So let's say n is p times q, where p and q are prime numbers. Then we're going to pick a random positive integer, a, which is less than n, and we're going to compute the GCD, the greatest common divisor, or what factor they have in common. We just want to make sure that it's not 1, because if it is, then uh, because this is a semi-prime number, which has only two prime factors, then it's either P or it's Q. Uh, so if that happened, then we're done here. If it's not, then we carry on and we do the rest of the procedure. So now we do quantum period finding to find the order of a mod n, where a is our random element, n is the number we're trying to factor, and that order is going to be k. If k is odd, we have to start over uh, because it's not going to work for what we're doing. But we can guarantee that k is even with a probability of at least two-thirds, uh, so that's good. 
Now, what we're going to do is compute a raised to the power of k over 2 mod n, and that's why we needed k to be even so that we can divide it by 2. If this is congruent to negative 1 mod n, we have to start over, uh, but this will not happen with a probability of at least 3 fourths, uh, so that's also good. By the definition of k, we know that it's not congruent to 1 mod n. Why is that? Because a to the k over 2, if that was 1, then k over 2 would be the order, not k, and that's because k was defined as the smallest number such that a to the k is 1 mod n. Now we're going to do a factoring trick to take advantage of the fact that we know it's not negative 1 or 1 mod n. So we write this as a to the k over 2 plus 1 times a to the k over 2 minus 1, and if you FOIL it out, then what you get is the product is a to the k minus 1. Uh, and so since a to the k was 1 mod n, a to the k minus 1 is 0 mod n. That means it's divisible by n. But since a to the k over 2 was not 1 or negative 1 mod n, then when you look at both of those factors, neither of those factors is 0 mod n. So what that means is that neither of those factors is divisible by n. So if we take the GCD of those factors with n, then both of them have to be factors of n that are not n themselves, meaning they're non-trivial factors. And since this was a semi-prime number, we know that one of them is p and the other one is q. Uh, so as far as Shor's algorithm in practice, we have implemented it on a quantum computer and it was able to factor 15 and 21, but not 35 and not 30 either. So. In terms of that, uh, we have not uh, set the world on fire yet, but it may happen sometime in the future. It may happen sooner than you think. So let's review what we just did in Shor's algorithm. Uh, the key point of this was the quantum phase estimation because it allowed us to find the order of A mod N quickly. Because we know this order, we can use the difference of squares factoring to notice that now we have two factors of n, neither of which is divisible by n. So we just found p and q, where p and q are the two primes whose product is n, and that's all we need to do to factor the integer, so we have broken RSA using our quantum computer. So make sure you've got this down, and then the last section is going to cover uh, how quantum period finding is the same thing as quantum phase estimation. So what quantum period finding is, is the same thing as quantum phase estimation, and we're going to talk about how. So let's say we have an eigenvector, and we're doing quantum phase estimation. We're going to get a phase that is some multiple of 1 over the period. Uh, and so this is because we're working with a discrete function, meaning you see on that picture that these are the x's. Those are the only points at which the function exists. And so what that does for us is because it's a discrete function, we know that uh, if we apply the function r times, where r is this period, it must return to 1. Uh, and that's just simply a fact of any discrete function, right? Because uh, let's say, give, to give an example, modular exponentiation. If the order is going to be k, uh, then let's say we ended up getting a phase that represents, say, a cubed, right? Then if you raise that to the k power, you're going to get a to the 3k. a to the 3k is also going to be 1, and for the same reason that a to the k is 1. And 1 cubed, of course, is 1. So what I'm saying here is that when we do quantum phase estimation on a discrete function, the phase we measure is an integer fraction of the period, and that's important. So uh, the way that we can get this eigenvector is that Peter Shore figured out that because of the way that the exponential sums representing the qubits work out, the 1 vector, which is just 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, is actually a superposition of all of the eigenvectors for modular exponentiation. Uh, and in that superposition, all of them have equal magnitude. Because of this, we don't need to bother about how do we get the eigenvector. We know what it is. It's just 1. We can put that into the quantum phase estimation circuit, and we just measure s over r as our phase with equal probability for every number s between 0 and r minus 1. 
Uh, and so the reason that it's equal probability for all of them is because of this superposition where we have superimposed all of the numbers with an equal magnitude. Uh, as you see here, that's 1 over square root of r. So let's review quantum period finding. Quantum period finding works because modular exponentiation is a discrete function, and so the phase that it's applied is a multiple of 1 over the period, an integer, s over r, where r is a period. We can take advantage of this by using quantum phase estimation to find the period, and then we can use that period because the period is the order of a mod n. And we can feed that into Shor's algorithm, which, as we showed before, allows us to factor the integer in polynomial time, in n cubed time, compared to that massive sub-exponential graph that we saw. So if you got this far, then congratulations. And we're just going to go to the final side. If you like this video, or if you want to know more, smash that like button. Oh, wait, this is the wrong video. Check out Quiskit. It's an interactive open source textbook. They also have lecture series. They're longer than this. Uh, and I based a lot of material off of what they've got on their website. So if you have any more questions at this point, leave a comment. I will answer it. And thank you for watching until the end.